Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. And thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, and because we've already talked about it a bit, there's my stuff, but we've got a lot to cover today and 20 minutes to do it. So we'll just jump right on in. So first and foremost, we are going to be talking about emotionally heavy content today. So I do want to give a couple trigger warnings right up front. So we will be covering things including mental illness, suicide, child death, war crimes, and psychological distress, all in terms of how they are represented within games. And as we go along, I will give you more concrete and informative informed consents and uh, content warnings as we get closer to the relevant topics, but just to give you an overhead of some of the things that we'll be talking about. Whoops. So today's session is all about the feels. Specifically, we're gonna be talking about those feels that are considered negative or unpleasant. These are emotions like grief and shame and guilt and regret. They are normal human emotions and part of our normal human experience, but we tend to avoid them in our daily lives because they make us feel uncomfortable, upset, and unsafe. Sometimes, however, we enjoy these kinds of experiences in our gameplay because games allow us to experience and process these difficult feelings in a safe way. In general, research has found that gameplay that evokes unpleasant emotions or challenging emotions can actually enrich gameplay and give it more meaning. So said another way, players enjoy games not in spite of negative emotions, but because of them. However, sometimes unpleasant emotions do not lead to enriched experiences, but instead result in psychological distress or feeling overwhelmed by negative emotions to where the player will disengage from the game either temporarily or permanently. When discomfort doesn't lead to that kind of rewarding or meaningful experience, it's usually because players feel overwhelmed that they've been pushed too far or that they, they can no longer trust the game designer themselves. And that's obviously a pretty big problem. So the focus of this talk is going to be on providing guidelines for walking the line between games that activate unpleasant or challenging emotions while minimizing the risk of psychological distress. Obviously, we can't predict everyone's line, but we, there are safety guidelines that we can put in place to minimize risk and mitigate any kind of impact. And that brings us to the APA ethics guide. Um, as a psychologist, the APA ethics code gives me guidance on how to best ethically handle situations where strong or overwhelming emotions are likely to occur, such as therapy or research settings. There are five general principles and 84 ethical standards that guide ethical interaction with the public as well as people in our care. Obviously, we are not going to be talking about all 84 uh, standards. That would, that would be a completely different talk but I have pulled out three that I do find helpful when designing for games. And the first one is boundaries of competence and then avoiding harm and informed consent. So let's talk first about what I mean by competence. Basically a psychologist can only practice within the scope of their training. So for example, I'm trained to work with teens and adults and I specialize in anxiety and depressive disorders. If someone were to come into my office and they want needed treatment for say an eating disorder, I'd really only have two ethical courses of action since I'm not trained in eating disorders. Either I can refer them to someone who is an expert and is trained, or before working with the client, I myself have to get training, consultation, and supervision from somebody who is an expert in order to make sure that I'm competent to treat that individual. So what does that look like in game design? Well, it's about knowing and respecting your team's limits around emotionally loaded content and topics. And it's okay, Not no one is an expert in everything. And so if you find yourself working on an emotionally heavy project and you are you know, having to Google an entire profession or culture's worth of knowledge and information, it's probably time to hand off the project to someone else or consult with an expert. It's important to remember that expertise includes things like social and emotional and cultural components, and that expertise via lived experience is just as valid as expertise through professional training. And ideally, you are, uh, you, you are utilizing both. So for example, you could be the foremost expert on pediatric cancer and still lack the needed social and emotional competence to create a game like that dragon cancer. A key question in evaluating competence is whether you and your team have that expertise 
to address emotionally challenging content in a way that does right by the player. If you are designing stories, environments, characters, mechanics, or anything like that, that are based on a topic beyond your scope of competence or knowledge, that feature a vulnerable population, or are as depicted in the game or as the target audience, or if you have situations in your game that could reasonably you know, elicit strong emotional reactions, your most ethical course of action is to consult. And that brings us to our first content warning, our first specific one. Um, so I'm briefly going to be speaking about symptoms of psychosis, including voice hearing and visual disturbances as they pretend to gameplay in Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice. And just so you know, each subsequent slide dealing with this topic will have a mini version of this warning on it. So if this is a difficult topic for you, you know, please feel free to take a break and avoid any slides that have this logo on it. So let's talk Hellblade, um, an example of a studio that really exemplified designing within their competence was Ninja Theory. They created Hellblade, which is a game about a warrior who is out for revenge for the murder of her loved ones. Senua, the protagonist, she experiences symptoms of psychosis and her perception of the world is influenced by past trauma and expressed via intrusive thoughts and auditory and visual hallucinations throughout the gameplay. Ninja Theory brought in experts by training. They had psychologists, they had psychiatrists and audio specialists, all there to ensure the accuracy of what they were portraying. However, they also brought in experts by lived experience, their mental health advisors. These are individuals who have personal lived experience with psychoses. And throughout the game development process, the devs worked with these individuals who had experienced voice hearing or visual disturbances or other symptoms. And they were able to integrate these lived experiences into the game and these, in, these integrations were really a uh, large part of why the game was so successful. So for example, several of the group members uh, described intensity of light or color, as well as confusion or disorientations as symptoms of their psychosis. And the dev team used their own expertise as game designers to translate these lived experiences into gameplay that felt authentic and genuine and avoided the pitfalls of things like mental health voyeurism or tourism. Next up, we're gonna talk about avoiding harm. That's our second uh, ethical code. So avoiding harm in psychology is exactly what it sounds like. You do your best to avoid harm um, at, at, all, at all turns. However, if harm is possible, if there is a potential for harm, then it is your job to ethically to minimize the risk of it happening and the possibility of its impact if it does. As a game designer, if you're intentionally designing for challenging emotions or creating situations that evoke unpleasant feelings like grief or loss or shame, there is an inherent potential for harm. And I'm gonna say that again, because it's really important. There is an inherent potential for harm. And so it doesn't mean that we can't talk about these things. It just means that we have to be really careful of how we do. So some strategies for minimizing risk and impact and thus avoiding harm. The first is informed consent, which we're gonna get into in just a minute. Another way to minimize risk and avoid harm is to ensure that you're practicing or designing from a place of competence. And as we just talked about, hopefully that's something that's already in place from the start. And so the third is prioritizing player well-being, which we're gonna talk about. So by prioritizing player well-being, it means making design decisions that are in the best interest of players. You're putting their emotional and psychological wellness before your gameplay. Player well-being is informed by competence and combined, they form the foundation for making ethical design decisions. And that brings us to our second content warning. I will be discussing suicide, suicide statistics, and suicide depiction in the game Life is Strange. As previously, if you see this little semicolon, you'll know to avoid this content if it's something you don't want. And there's a little semicolon there. So if you're not familiar with Life is Strange, it's an award-winning and critically acclaimed narrative adventure game. And the protagonist, Max Caulfield, she's a high school student who discovers she has the ability to rewind time. The game covers a variety of topics from mental illness and disability to LGBTQ relationships. Early in the game, there's a very famous scene where one of Max's friends named Kate Marsh, she dies by suicide on screen by walking off the roof of her school. After you witness Kate die as the player, you're able to reverse time and meet Kate on the roof before she jumps. 
While on the roof, you're presented with a series of questions to answer, and largely they're based on whether or not you've gotten to know Kate and what you remember from those conversations. If you respond well enough, Kate steps back and you can help her to safety. If not, however, she walks off the roof and dies anyway. And to make this situation even more intense, whatever happens is permanent. Despite the core mechanic of this game being the ability to reverse time and prevent horrible things from happening, in this moment, Max says she's too tired to do another reversal. And so the player will be unable to change whatever outcome they get. This is one of only two times in the entire game where this is the case. If we're designing from a place of competence, that means that the dev team already knows some of the basic facts about suicide, like that it's the 10th most common cause of death in the United States, and the second most common cause of death for people between 10 and 34 in the US. They'd also know already that LGBTQ plus youth are five times more likely to attempt suicide than their heterosexual peers. We'd also know how common suicide is and its impact on those who have lost someone to suicide. 85% of people know someone who's been personally, know someone personally who has completed suicide. And we also know from research that feelings of guilt, shame, and self-blame are very common reactions to those who have lost someone. Avoiding harm in this situation would be to remember all of those stats and then make design decisions informed by those stats that prioritize the psychological safety of your players. We know that given the content in this game and its target audience, the likelihood that someone playing this game will have either attempted suicide or know someone who has attempted suicide is very, very high. We also know that people who often, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> we know that those who are left behind often feel an intense sense of guilt and bl often blame themselves, saying things like, I should have seen the signs, I should have done more, or if only I had said the right things. Avoiding harm would be giving players multiple ways out. This could have been a content warning so players could avoid the content altogether. Players could have been given an option to sk skip the quiz and avoid talking about the feelings and, or <laughs> avoid feelings of guilt about not having paid attention, shame around not talking enough with Kate or self blame at having not known the right things to say. But the big one here, the one that really gets me is the decision to remove time reversal. While the idea is to increase tension and make the process of answering Kate's questions feel even more loaded, we're already dealing with suicide. We don't need to poke at known vulnerabilities like guilt and grief and pain for the impact to be there. So there have been lots of arguments made that providing these kinds of content warnings or options somehow lessen the impact or the power of the moment. However, my argument is that if games are forcing players to choose between playing through a scene that is highly distressing or having to quit the game, then we are obviously doing it wrong as designers. Because trauma is not a plot twist. It's not a plot point. It is certainly not the prize in the bottom of our cereal box. By giving alternate routes through emotionally heavy or difficult content, we allow to the design for avoiding harm and minimizing risk. It's also a form of accessibility as you know, some players aren't able to access this and they may shut down. And obviously we don't want players to shut down because if they have a negative experience, they may regret playing the game and turn away from the game altogether, which again, is not what we want as designers. Another example of this that I wanna highlight comes from the game, What Remains of Edith Finch, which is a marvelous, wonderful game all about our relationship to death, loss, grief, and mental illness. It also necessitates a content warning around in-death game of a child. So watch out for the teddy bear if this is a tough topic. The fishery vignette in Edith Finch might be one of the most powerful and moving empathetic depictions of mental illness I've ever seen in a game. And I almost didn't get to experience it. In Edith Finch, you play as a member of the Finch family on the day of their death. And one of these vignettes features Gregory, who's a two-year-old who loves his bath time. During the scene, Gregory's mom becomes distracted. And in the course of playing with your bath toys as Gregory, you hit the faucet and the tub fills up and Gregory drowns. It's done as artistically and gently as possible, but this scene still absolutely broke me. At the time I was playing What Remains of Edith Finch, my son was also two and he loved bath time. 
And I will never forget starting the Gregory vignette, seeing that crib and realizing what the game was going to ask me to do. And I literally said out loud, oh God, please, please don't make me do this. But the game did. And ultimately I couldn't. I could not complete the vignette. I had to have someone else play through for me while I cried my eyes out. And if not for someone else literally taking over with the controller, I would have never gotten, I would have never come back to the game for sure. And I never would have finished it. And that would, been, would have been a real shame given how good of a game Edith Finch is. And the funny thing though, is that my son is fine. <laughs> I have thankfully never had any scare with him related to his health or his safety. He's now almost five and he still loves his bath time. But that's the power of the emotions that we are playing with as designers. We don't have to, we as players don't have to have experienced the same trauma that's being depicted on screen to become overwhelmed by it and to become distressed by it. Ultimately, I'm happy I finished the game. But to this day, every single time I think about that scene with Gregory, I just wish I could have skipped it. I genuinely wish that I have never played it. And then that brings us to informed consent, our last, our last standard here. So informed consent, the short version, and it applies to both clinical and game dev spaces, is that people have a right to know what they are signing up for. And even though this is pulled from the AP ethics guide, I'm pulling only parts three and four, although most of them could be applied. So it was, let's start with subsection four. Subsection four basically states that people need to be made aware of factors that may influence their participation, especially as it pertains to potential risk, discomfort, or adverse effects. And what this means for us as game devs is that players have a right to know about the content that could be potentially disturbing or cause distress. One could even argue that's what the ESRB is for. You know, as a rating system, the ESRB is great, it is, but it's not enough. It's not equipped to talk about these kinds of games. For example, Sea of Solitude, a wonderful game, is rated T for teen due to quote, fantasy, violence, and language. However, if you've ever played Sea of Solitude, you know that the game contains themes and content related to domestic violence, alcoholism, suicide, harassment, helplessness, and hopelessness. These topics are definitely not covered by quote, fantasy, violence, and language. So to their credit, many games that deal with these kinds of difficult topics do provide a more extensive content warning, which is great, but like all things, a good content warning takes work. So I'll be using, jumping back to Hellblade momentarily, as it has one of the best content warnings I've seen in a game to kind of outline what, what one would look for. So first, the warning is in the game itself. It's not on the box art, it's not in the descriptions, it's not on a poster next to the game that's being demoed. It's the first thing you see when the game starts. Two, sorry, a little behind here. All right, second, it's very specific. It directly calls out what the most potentially harmful content is. And in this case, it's depictions of psychosis. Third, it calls out people who may be vulnerable, especially vulnerable to harm. And in this case, that includes people who have experienced psychosis as well as persons who have may, may have had similar experiences or diagnoses. Fourth, it directs players to resources. This is an, apologies for the cats. This is an example of not just doing no harm, but intentionally doing right by players. <laughs> Anticipating that there may be harm or distress and providing support for them from the start. And then at last they include uh, additional warnings. So here it's calling out that Hellblade has additional violent scenes that people may find distressing. So personally, I think they could have been a bit more specific here because there are violent scenes in Hellblade that, you know, there's one where body parts literally grab at you as you walk by. And again, that's not really covered by quote unquote violent scenes. So a little more specificity would have been helpful. And last but not least, one place the content warning um, sorry, one place the content warning missed the mark was lack of affirmative consent. The content warning appears on the screen unprompted and fades away after only a set amount of time. It is totally possible to miss the warning and the associated resources if you're up grabbing a snack or in the bathroom. 
Having an I understand or other kind of button ensures that players don't accidentally miss the content warning. It's also an accessibility issue as not everyone can read or process information at the speed the game determines. For part three of informed consent, the potential penalties for withdrawing our participation is subsection three there. Core to this idea is that if people experience punishment for quitting, then there's an inherent pressure to continue even against their own interests or well being. In research, we refer to this as undue inducement or coercion. So getting someone to do something they don't want to do because of a perceived threat. Now, obviously, we don't force people to play games, but there can be a sense of pressure or coercion because maybe we have monetarily or time-wise or are socially pressured into continuing the game. Besides, the whole point is we want people to play our games, but we don't want people to regret playing our games. So the solution here is allowing people to feel more able to walk away and not feel bad about it, that is to avoid coercion, is to let them know that they have options and they're not gonna be penalized for using those options. And so a really great example of that is Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, which I know it came out a while ago, but it actually has a really good series of content warnings that demonstrate, hey, it's in the game. And it's not super clear on what is uh, possibly disturbing or offensive, but uh, you know, at least it lets you know. The good thing that it does is it calls out that you will not be punished for participating um, or skipping this level, which is a really good way to avoid coercion. It does require affirmative consent, and then of course, you know, it's a little bit snowflakey, at least in terms of, you know, yes, ask me later or no, I will not be offended. So could have done better, but that's where we're at. So just to summarize, the game does not require you to play this level. And so whether you can skip it entirely, or if you do end up in the level, you can always just choose not to engage and the game will go on without it as if nothing happened. So therefore you're allowing your players to opt out without quitting and without negative consequence. So let's do a real quick recap here, because I know we're just at time. When playing, with intense un when playing with intense, unpleasant emotions like grief and guilt and triggering topics like suicide, ethical guidelines can help us design experiences that enrich and engage rather than distress and distance. And we can use these existing ethical frameworks like the APA Ethics Code to provide guidance for emotionally challenging content. In terms of competence, basically, do you have the skills, social, emotional, cultural, and otherwise to do right by your players and by the core material? And if not, it's time to consult. There's nothing wrong with that. In terms of avoiding harm, if you have the competence, are you designing from a place where psychological safety takes priority? In other words, is competence being applied and integrated with player well-being to formulate ethical design decisions? And last but not least, with informed consent, are you building in off ramps that allow for alternate routes so that players can stay engaged in your game, even if parts are too distressing? Are you allowing them to opt out without consequences? And are you doing everything you can to avoid coercion so that players don't regret having played your game? And so my final piece to you is that everyone is familiar with this idea of the Hippocratic Oath, a first do no harm. But the second part of that declaration states that we must, do, that we must actively try to do right by the people in our care. By using ethical guidelines of competence, avoiding harm, and informed consent, we can continue to tell stories that evoke powerful emotional experiences while also being mindful of the power of those emotional experiences and taking steps to protect and prioritize the psychological well being of our players. And that is my time. And I want to remind everybody to jump on over to the Imagine QA room where I will be hanging out to answer any questions. Thank you all so much. <laughs>